match burns roughly eight seconds. A life lasts roughly 80 years. Here one moment and gone the next. If you're smart, you'll use that time wisely. Hello everyone, I'm so glad that you made it today for week three of our journey through Ecclesiastes. Now if you caught the first two weeks, you know this is a doozy of a way to kick off a summer. And if you missed Derek in week one or my sermon last week, I really encourage you to go back to watch or listen. We know it's summer, we know schedules get crazy, but we've got so many ways for you to stay connected. So check us out on Facebook, on YouTube, or whoisgrace.com. Plus, we've got a reading plan on version. so look for What's the Point, part two, and that will take you through the next two weeks of this series. So in week one, Derek introduced us to the book. This is wisdom literature, but it's of a different tone than what you're going to find in Proverbs. The author of Ecclesiastes is a teacher or preacher called Kohelet and in, he- in Hebrew, so we're calling him Q. And most of the 12 chapters of the book are Q's monologue, his musings on all things about life and living, wisdom, work, pleasure, and death. You name it, and he explores it in his quest to answer this question. What's the point? So what are we doing here? Why are we here? Does anything we do matter? Does it last? Does it change the world? Q's answers, not going to be easy or fun, and they're going to leave us unsatisfied because he's weary, but so are we. So Derek laid out a challenge the challenge of Ecclesiastes for us, that we must own our weariness and let that weariness take us to our knees in prayer. After all, this world is not our true home. We're not meant to be fully satisfied here under the sun. We're made for eternity. Now, last week I took to, took us on a quest with Q. The first leg of Q's quest is the search for wisdom. And he searched high and low under the sun and his conclusion was this. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has had great experience and wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is but a striving after wind. For in much wisdom is much much vexation. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. So what's the point of life? Well, gaining worldly wisdom and earthly knowledge isn't it. But remember, we're infusing hope into each of these sermons because unlike Q, our perspective does not need to be stuck here under the sun. We've got the New Testament revelation of God's work in our hearts and in the world. And so last week we learned that the true conclusion to the quest for wisdom is this. Infinite wisdom is beyond you, but within him. Because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we've been given the spirit of counsel, a very wise helper, And he's not out there somewhere. He's right here in every single person who claims Christ as Lord and Savior. Praise God for that. Amen. Now, Q's not done, not even closed. He's continuing his quest. Remember, the core question for Q and for all of us while we live on this earth is, what's the point? So today, we're picking up with Q on his quest for success. In week one, Derek quoted a college professor and he said, let me paraphrase Ecclesiastes for you. Go have a big monument built for yourself, and then have birds fly over and poop on it. That's what we're exploring today. All those monuments, figurative and literal, that we strive to build, that become our own little kingdoms here on earth. So let me start with a story I read recently. Cornelius Vanderbilt was from a poor family whose Dutch ancestor was an indentured servant who came to New Amsterdam, that's New York City today, to start a new life. And in the early to mid-1800s, Cornelius began doing business with one boat, just carrying goods across the New York Harbor. And through hard work and toil, he built a shipping and railroad empire. He gained success, every advantage, and so much wealth. Even at his death in 1877, the Commodore, as he came to be called, was the richest man in America. And he left all that wealth and all that fortune to 11 of his living children. Now, the Commodore's children and their descendants, they toiled to build these mega mansions on Fifth Avenue in New York City and in Newport, Rhode Island. Maybe you've visited the Breakers there or the Biltmore in Asheville, North Carolina. They flaunted and spent their wealth. They traveled the world in class. Their clothes were all couture. They hosted parties that would rival today's most extravagant weddings. They were American royalty. 
But eventually, the Commodore's money ran out. Of their 48 houses, 12 have been demolished and most of the rest have been sold to other private owners or to public preservation societies, universities, other institutions. Here's a snapshot for you of Millionaire's Row on Fifth Avenue where the Commodore's kids built mansions that took up multiple city blocks. And then here's a photo from that same section of Fifth Avenue today. By the 1950s and 60s, almost all the money was gone. Less than a century after the Commodore's death, what he had worked so hard to build had mostly disappeared. In a recent autobiography, Anderson Cooper, a journalist and descendant of the Commodore, wrote this. They know the cost of everything and the value of nothing. What's left of all their striving, all that building, like vapor, it vanished. And that's a key concept in Ecclesiastes. Q repeatedly uses the word hevel to describe life. It's vanity, vapor, smoke. It's like chasing the wind. So here's what I'm imagining. I imagine the Commodore sitting down with Q at some outdoor cafe on Fifth Avenue, and the Commodore has a big old cigar in his hand, and he's watching the taxis and the traffic and the pedestrians, the shoppers, the whole world's passing by. And Q, look over, Q looks over and asks him, what did you gain by all the toil at which you toiled under the sun? The Commodore doesn't move, doesn't answer. He just puffs his cigar and watches the smoke evaporate. Perhaps it was a man like the Commodore, or maybe it was own, his own life. Either way, some rich man inspired Q to reflect and write. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, and it lies heavy on mankind, a man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires. Yet God does not give him power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. It is a grievous evil. So Q and the Commodore, they give us our big idea today. In your quest for success, all your hard work is a dead end. Let's get into Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and join Q on his quest for success. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise or a fool, yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun, because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What has a man from all the toil and striving of his heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. Oh, wow. Here we go. Into the weariness, onto the hamster wheel, throwing up our hands and feeling the angst alongside Q. Remember, we're going to let ourselves sit in this for a while each week in the series before we glimpse hope. Why? Because I think if we don't really let ourselves own the weariness and really feel this hevel, then we won't ever be really hungry for something real, something lasting, an eternal answer to the big question, what's the point? So hang in there with me and look more closely at verse 22. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? Remember that phrase, beneath the sun, or sometimes Q says, under the sun. That phrase reminds us that the perspective of this entire book is only of life here on earth. Q's view, it's a valley view. It's a limited perspective. He's not looking at life from the redemptive vantage point that we have as Christ followers. And here in this verse, we're also introduced to a new theme. Toil is a word that's used 22 times as a noun, 13 times as a verb throughout the book. It could be translated as hard work or labor. This is just the routine struggle of humanity to achieve some end or other. I really like this definition from one commentary. It said, Toil is the tiresome effort expended over an enterprise of dubious result. Have you ever toiled over something only to have it be for nothing? About 50% of my gardening is like this. I try, I really do. I plant, I weed, I water. Sometimes I forget about the water, but I do try. And there they hang, limp, wilted, and dry. Or there was this time when I researched and studied, and I was so excited about preaching from Hebrews 9 that Jesus is the better sacrifice. March 22nd, 2020 was the big day. But our doors had closed, and we had pivoted to addressing the very real and immediate consequences of COVID. So what about you? What are some seemingly good and worthwhile things that you toil over, that you invest time and money and energy into that you just see crumbling at the end of the day? 
Sometimes it's the so-called little things like my flowers. Maybe it's a new recipe that took you hours and tasted like sawdust. Or you just finished those 12 loads of laundry, folded it all, put it all away, deep sigh, and then your son brought his dirty uniform he'd had stuffed in his backpack. Or something a little bigger, like you planned and packed and prepared, and then you tested positive for COVID and your vacation was put on hold again. Maybe you put in hours training a new coworker only to have them up and quit. But maybe it's something even bigger. Maybe it's like you gave your kid everything when they were young, all the camps, all the right activities, all the opportunities, and they've just dropped out of college and they won't even talk to you. Or you gave your best years to your company and they laid you off before you could retire. I mean, we could sit here for hours and make lists of all the ways that we have toiled and labored and tried and worked so dang hard just to watch it all evaporate like smoke. Q must have made these lists because look at what he says in verse 23. For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. I've got to read this verse in the NIV too. It says, all their days their work is grief and pain. Even at night, their minds do not rest. All our days, sorrow, grief, pain, Q says. And the work, heh, that's a vexation. You know, a pain in the you-know-what. So much so that we can't even sleep well at night. And if we thought that this was just a modern problem of our day, Q's revealing that this is an ancient one. And here's, here's some hard data for us. If an employee works 47 hours per week from the age of 18 until 62 without missing a scheduled shift or requesting vacation time, that employee will spend approximately 109,980 hours at work. Now, hopefully everyone's taking some vacation so we could get those hours under 100,000, but still, that's a really, really big number. And that number is only taking into account your actual employment. It doesn't factor in that moms with little kids toil for at least 18 hours a day, more if you have an infant waking you up all night. That doesn't factor in that the household chores that we do or the property maintenance and homeowners keep up with. And it certainly doesn't take into account any volunteer hours that you're giving to nonprofits, to the church, to a school, to a club, right? Listen, if we start doing all that math, we're all going to quit right now, crawl under the bed and just have a good cry. Thanks so much, Q. So what's the point? Why do we work so hard? Why all this endless toil that doesn't even guarantee great outcomes? Somewhere in the answer lies this drive to matter, this need to succeed. Like we're not just wired to sit around, we're made for something purposeful. We see that truth from the beginning. In Genesis 2, God gave Adam and Eve work to do. They were to steward the earth. They're in charge of everything that God had made. It started with naming all of the animals. Wouldn't that have been a cool job? So from the beginning, we were made for work. And in Genesis 2, that work was grand, it was fulfilling, it was done perfectly, and it brought delight to God, to Adam and Eve, and to creation. And then Genesis 3 happens. And God curses the earth and curses Adam for his sin. And he says, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread till you return to the ground. So that might be a bit of a clue as to why work is such a vexation. Now I have some more questions about God's curse on Eve, but that's for a different sermon. So we can't deny... Work is hard and it's wearying. And Genesis 3 reveals that it's been part of the story of, human, of humankind from the beginning. This isn't unique to us. It's not unique to Q. In mankind's quest for success, all our hard work is a dead end. Now, before you curse me for talking about work on your day off, let's dig in with Q for a bit. What's the point of work? Why do we strive so hard? Q seems to land on two answers, two reasons that we work and seek success. First, for compensation, so that we can meet our basic needs. And second, for significance, because our needs are actually more ba than basic. So these are the two stops on Q's quest for success. So let's explore the first. Compensation as a means of gaining success. Q recognizes that we work hard to meet our basic needs. Yes, food, shelter, clothing, but... Then we need more and more. We want more and more. So we work more and more. We toil harder, striving for more and for better. Why is that, Q? He says, Then I saw all toil and all skill and work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. All toil and all skill and work is driven by envy? 
I admit that 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 I had to sit in that for a while. My gut reaction was that Q must have lived near some really nasty people. But then as I got to thinking about it, I thought maybe he's right. It isn't that we don't have enough to meet our fundamental needs. It's true. We do get envious of what others had. I think there's far more keeping up with the Joneses or Kardashians or your Insta influencer of choice than maybe we realize. Whatever we have, there always seems to be some greener grass growing somewhere, right? Now, we might call it by something a little less grubby sounding than greed, like you're just trying to get ahead. But get ahead of who? Or you just want to get a leg up. Again, a leg up on who? Or you want to give your kids more. More as compared to whom? However we restate and reframe, this really just boils down to the covetousness of the human heart that the 10th commandment speaks against. God warned against it because it's an insatiable lust. To work out of envy is a motive of the heart that can never be satisfied. There will always be more. There will always be better. And greater compensation will become something less like a hard-earned wage for work and more like a demanding taskmaster that takes most of your time, more of your energy, more of your joy and peace. Not just a distraction, but something that looks and sounds a lot like an idol. And listen, you may end up building something grand like Vanderbilt Mansions on Fifth Avenue. It's your own little kingdom. But the birds are going to come. They're going to poop on it all the same. And the wreckers are going to come, and someday it'll be knocked down. Listen to Q. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. Again, I saw vanity under the sun. One person who has no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil, and his eyes are never satisfied with riches, so that he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. The dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished, and forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. So what's the point? Whatever you earn, achieve, build, accomplish, Q is telling you that it will not satisfy, it will not last. The work's going to be forgotten. You will be forgotten. All the compensation in the world, even a fortune as vast as Cornelius Vanderbilt, will just dissolve like vapor. The Commodore and Q, they remind us that in your quest for success, all your hard work is a dead end. Now, stick with me. Q's not quite done yet. There's two stops on his quest for success, so we've got to move on to the second. Significance as a means of gaining success. Now, Q might not have had Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but he knows that people are not ants. He knows we need the basics, of course, but we also need things like safety and security and relationships and We need significance. Significance, this sounds like a lot more noble a pursuit than compensation. I'm not doing this for the money. I'm doing it for the legacy or the impact or it's for the children or for the future or for you fill in the blank. What do you work hard for? Maybe it is just for the paycheck, but I'll bet there's something in your life that you labor over that feels bigger than just money. And I'm sure it is bigger and nobler and worthwhile. Q witnessed that. He experienced it. And guess what? He's got some comments for us. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me, and who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? This is the true legacy we're left with. This is what Cornelius Vanderbilt would see today. Life is unpredictable. You can neither depend on the wealth you hoard, nor can you predict the character of those who might one day inherit it. One commentary sums it up this way. Since holding on to wealth is problematical during life and impossible at death, The laborer really toils for something of little or no substance, the wind. In the long run, such toil is a waste of time. In other words, in your quest for success, all your hard work is a dead end. Now, does Q ever get to an answer to our question, what's the point of all this hard work? He does, and it's fascinating. And before we jump into that, let me just give credit to Tim Mackey for his teaching on this passage of Ecclesiastes. So what I want you to do is join me in chapter four. Let's look at Q's solution. 
The fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh. Better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and a striving after wind. The fool folds his hands. Now the word hands here is the Hebrew word yad, which means the area from your fingertips to your elbow. So the image here is that of a fool folding his arms. So go ahead, do that with me. Now when we cross our arms, we're usually stepping away from something, right? Or we're disagreeing, disapproving. In some way, we are distancing ourselves physically. Hugh's meaning here is that the fool crosses his arms and stops working. He's just done. He's concluded that working hard is hevel, it's all worthless, it's vanity, so why bother? And the fool's answer is to quit. Potato chips and video games from now on, or whatever your dream escape would be. If you've ever felt like this, if you've ever done this, Tim Mackey says that you're squandering the fact that you've been given life and breath and a chance to do something. Now jump to the end of verse 6 for another possible answer. It says, two hands full of toil. Two hands full is the Hebrew chofen, which looks like grabbing fistfuls. So go ahead and do that. Like you're holding tight and not letting go. You're going to grab fistful after fistful, everything you can get, whether it's compensation or significance, you want it all. And in this extreme, you're a workaholic. And the unfortunate thing is this. In these United States, we will scorn the lazy man and his yad. But we applaud this idea of chofen. So while we might do both at times, we feel good about grabbing fistfuls. I found this reflection of Madonna's very telling. She said, I have an iron will and all of my will has always been to conquer some horrible feeling of inadequacy. I push past one spell of it and then discover myself as a special human being. And then I get to another stage and think that I'm mediocre and uninteresting again and again. My drive in life, it's from this horrible fear of being mediocre, and that's always pushing me because even though I've become somebody, I still have to prove that I am somebody. My struggle has never ended, and it probably never will. She's grasping for significance, and again and again, finding that it is a dead end. What's the answer, Q? And now in the middle of this passage, we get a quick glimpse at something like an answer, something sort of, kind of, almost like hope for Q. Hear it again. The fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh. Better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and a striving after wind. Did you catch it? Better is a handful of quietness. A handful is the Hebrew word kaf, and it's the image of an open palm. So do that with me. Not both hands, just one palm. This hand is working, but working with an open hand. And the other is down because it's resting. So do you see what's happening here? It's like you're driving with one hand on the wheel and the other's holding your wife's. Or you're balancing that checkbook while the worship music plays. Or you're digging that hole while recounting the goodness of God in your life. You're working that deal knowing that you'll meet friends for dinner in an hour. It's a picture of working from a place of rest, which is a complete paradox. But somehow Q knows it's better to have just one hand in the game. Turns out that Q's quest for success led him somehow to rest. Okay, this is great. So life and work down here under the sun, that's no picnic. Q's established that. So Q, then tell us more about this cough. How is it possible to work and rest? But he doesn't go into it. He doesn't tell us how. And as he does so well, he calls us out. He leads us into the angst. He merely exposes the weariness of our problem. But Q's not here to solve it. And so for the true conclusion, we need to continue our quest beyond Q's valley view. What Q couldn't see has been shown to us, revealed in the coming of the promised Messiah, revealed by the light of the world, revealed in the person of Jesus Christ, Son of God, creator of the world, Savior of the weary. Listen to what Jesus taught in Matthew 11. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lonely in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Somehow in this life of hard work and toil, somehow in the journey of following Jesus with all the hard things and the difficult things that are scattered through our days here under the sun, somehow in the midst of hard jobs and difficult bosses and boring tasks and the daily grind of 9 to 5 or 11 to 7, somehow... He gives us rest. And we can choose to shoulder the burden of life and work alone, all on our own. Or we can yoke up with Jesus. The picture here is two animals who are laboring side by side. Both are working, but the work is shared. 
This is the kaf that Q talked about, working with one open palm and one resting hand. And what is crazy is that this concept wasn't revolutionary in Jesus' day or in our day or even in Q's day. At the very beginning, God showed us that work is best paired with rest. He created for six days and then rested on the seventh. And he commanded that his people do the same, work hard, labor, and then rest. And what's happening is that in the rest, you are activating trust in God. You are saying through your rest that your own success and significance does not depend upon all that toil, right? It does not depend upon all of your hard work. Work, when done alongside the Lord, yoked to Jesus, then you allow him to also lead you to rest. Can you feel the difference between that relentless grasping and striving and the hard work that's then accompanied by rest? I'm asking the Spirit of Jesus right now to stir you up with a deep longing for that yoke of Jesus. Now, keep that picture in your mind, yoked with Jesus, one hand at work, the other at rest. And let me go back to the beginning of this same passage in Matthew, because what Jesus was actually doing was saying a prayer to God on behalf of his disciples. Listen to how he starts praying. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. In light of our quest with Q, do you hear the irony in Jesus' words? You have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. I wonder if the infinite mind of Christ had Q in mind when he said this, had you and me in mind. Listen, every dead end on Q's quest and every meandering path on ours leads to this conclusion. In our own wisdom, in our own strength, in our own striving, in our own toil, we will not find ultimate success or meaning or significance. Ask Q, ask Cornelius Vanderbilt and his descendants, ask yourself. Like like little children who instinctively know how to go 100 miles an hour all day in an amusement park and then pass out in the car before it leaves the parking lot. Like little children who instinctively depend on someone and lean on someone and trust someone, we are meant to find all things of worth and significance, like wisdom and like rest, in Christ alone. That yoke that Jesus wants to share with you, you know what's on his side? He took on the greatest burdens of this life, despair, worthlessness, every single sin, and death, all the hevel, and he took it all to the cross because he loves you, and because he made you for far more than throwing away your life in some futile quest for success. You don't have to work and strive for your significance or to find meaning under the sun. Jesus, he gave his life for all of that. To belong to him is the meaning of life. Yoke to Jesus, there are no dead ends. Let me close with two quick next steps. First, I want you to prepare for Monday. When I was a high school Spanish teacher, there was always this little lump in my stomach on Sunday nights, knowing that the hamster wheel was just going to start spinning again in the morning. Now, all of you teachers have a breather for the summer, but no matter where you work, whether you're staying at home or going to an office or somewhere in between, and whether or not Monday is even the start of your work week, you get the idea. Prepare yourself. Put yourself in the cough position. Open one palm. Give the burden of this week's work to Jesus. Imagine yourself yoked to him and invite him into the labor and toil of your work. And now the other part of that cough image, right, is the hand by your side, the one at rest. That's the second next step. Schedule some rest. We've talked often of the Sabbath around here. Start with an hour or two or even a half day this week. Just rest. Take a walk. Go for a swim. Crank up your favorite worship songs. Trust Jesus enough to pause and just be in his presence, setting all work aside. And remember, you're a valued, beloved child of God. That is your significance.